Hey, Power Athlete Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Premier Podcast in Strength and Conditioning. I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Chris McQuilkin, a.k.a. Tex. Hello. And we are joined by our good friend, Jason Gardner, who was connected to us via Kirk Parsley and uh, kind of, uh, from what at least what Kirk says, a bit of a legend in NSW for Naval Special Warfare. So thanks for coming on Power Athlete Radio. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, so so much to cover, and you and I are speaking at the upcoming NSCA Tactical Conference. So we saw your name come across the keynote speaker board, and I was like, "All right, man, I know I know somebody that knows you." <laughs> yeah. It's not that big a circle. Yeah, and you're you've accomplished a lot, and now have turned it over to a speaking and a leading career from your historic career within the the military, man. So how long was that military career? And let's talk about bullet points in which you aim to now take that experience and empower others. So I did 30 years in the SEAL teams. I got nine deployments, five combat deployments. I um, rose all the way to the level of uh, command master chief. So master chief is the highest enlisted rank you can achieve and the command master chief when they actually put you in, you know, the second in command of the SEAL team. And then uh, I, I was also second in command of our training attachment, running all the training for the West Coast SEAL team. And I'll tell you, when I started, that was not my intention. I didn't have an ambition to um, reach that level, but it just wound up being one of those things where it's like, hey, if you're going to stay, stay around, then you you have to lead. And, and honestly, I was resistant to having any more responsibility than I, than I had, but um, Luckily, I had a bunch of great mentors and folks along the way that that helped me, you know, with each goal. And then then I think one of the the reason that, uh, I, I, you know, my career was successful is that I had great people around me. And I always tried to find those folks that I thought that were better than me and pull them in and keep them close and uh and, and just keep them around. So that, that wound up working really, really well. Uh, I've known Jocko since 1993. Um, so we've been friends for a long time. And then when the podcast, when the book came out, it was right at that point in time when I transitioned out of being a tactical leader to an executive leader. And what that means is like from being in charge of a task unit when I was actually out doing the job with the task unit or doing the job running land warfare training on doing the job still essentially and then you promote a new executive leadership where now i'm up in an office all day and you know hand picking out emails with two fingers and going to meetings and i was just dying i was so miserable doing that but you know i still enjoyed the peer group and the seal teams and that's right when when extreme ownership came out at that state when i made that transition that book comes out and so I'm like, okay, Jocko and Leif got a book. I, I got I to gotta take it in. So I listened to it on Audible on, on my commute into work. And it really, really opened my eyes and changed my perspective on how I thought about leadership. Because honestly, up until then, I wasn't really thinking about leadership. It was just like, this is the new position title that I have. But I wasn't introspective with it. And that forced me to be introspective and look at how I could First of all, take ownership of things and solve problems. And sec- second of all, more importantly, like, hey, how do I work with other people and lead in a way that's effective and cooperative and all that? And so the book showed me a bunch of stuff that, I, that I've been doing wrong and then other things that I was doing correctly, but I just didn't have a name for it. You know, like, you know, some of the laws of combat and all that. So I loved it. And then the podcast came out and, and I'll never forget the day that like, uh, my wife was at home and she's rototilling and she's like running this rototiller because we had a farm at the time. And she's like, Hey, do you know that Jocko has got a podcast? And I was like, no. And she goes, you don't know what podcasts are, do you? And I'm like, <laughs> no. so she's like, give me your phone. She takes my phone. She, she helps me download the first couple podcasts. So then instead of listening to talk radio and just getting angry on my commute into work every day, I'm now I'm listening to the podcast and they're so great because the, like the podcasts, I, I, I've completely changed my life and I'm, I'm exponentially a better person because I'm able to sit around and listen to these conversations that it, super interesting people are having about really interesting stuff. And it's just making me better instead of just a cyclical 
let me get mad, uh, you know, that talk radio is going on and actually it's all, all you do is listen to commercials. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to, to the, all these podcasts come out in real time. I'm applying it in real time and I'm talking to Jocko and then I got the opportunity to work with Echelon Front, which was great. So that, like I retired and a week later I was doing my first gig talking about leadership with Echelon Front and you know, what we do at Echelon Front, we solve problems through leadership because every problem anyone has at a business or otherwise is a leadership problem. And so that, that's all we do. We just talk about leadership and help people solve these problems and become better people and become better family members and better spouses and better, better members of the community. And it's great because everybody, everybody wins. They're, everybody is winning in this situation. So yeah, it's, it's been going great. And, and even with COVID, you know, it's like we kind of transitioned to doing things virtually. And that's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great thing as well because it's been, now our reach is just burnt. Do you feel that um, it's not as impactful in a virtual setting? I know when we do podcasts in person, we always have a much more rich experience, but it just isn't always possible to get people sitting here with us. Do you feel like in a leadership environment that when you can go out and present in front of a group of individuals, it's more impactful than something done through a Zoom or a virtual setting? Oh, yeah, being in person is absolutely better, but it's also, it depends. So like, I just got done speaking to probably like 150 people and I can't see the folks in the back row and they can't really see me. But in, in this kind of venue, you know, they can see me up close. And then for Zoom, I I like Zoom over um, Teams. A lot of times I can read the, the, the facial expressions and I'm able to see if I'm hitting the mark with what I'm saying, or it does, does the topic I've got need a little bit ex more explanation. The bottom line is, is like, it's, it's way better than nothing at all. And for a lot of folks in businesses, you know, especially post COVID where people are like, we're not even coming into office space anymore. Um, this is, this is a great, this is a great second to that, to, to that doing it in person. But you're, you're right. The, the being in person, if I was sitting there in, in the room with you, it'd be way better. So as you go through your, your talk, um, can you, can you walk us through it? Uh, if you were going to coach us on leadership and help Texan, I'd be better leaders and, um, you know, better spouses and friends and whatnot. Like, where would we start? Like, what's the, What's the journey? How does it begin? Yeah, I mean, we'd start out with talking about those laws of combat, which are um, basically when when Jocko took over, after he comes back from Ramadi as a task unit commander, he, he is then put in charge of the training, the sustainment training for all the West Coast SEAL teams. And as he's running the training, he's seen some task units do good. He's seen other task units just do awful. And he's like, I've got to come up with a framework that these guys can apply that's going to work. So he goes back to his room that night in the, and he comes up with the laws of combat. And there's, it's, it's really simple. There's four of them. It's cover and moves, simple, prioritize and execute and decentralize command. Um, those, those are the four laws. And we know that they apply well to the battlefield. What he didn't know and discovered later was they apply everywhere. They apply everywhere. So cover and move, the first law of combat, that's about teamwork. That's about putting the mission first and working with all the other departments and other organizations that you're working with to accomplish that mission, right? Because if, say you're in manufacturing and you're on the line doing the manufacturing. Well, if the salespeople aren't doing a good job, who, who pays the price for that? Everybody pays the price. And, 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 and flip that around, if you're not doing a good job on the manufacturing floor, that's affecting everybody at that company. Um, if, you're, if you're a first responder and the um, dispatchers aren't doing that, their job, that's affecting the whole system. So you've got to work together. And we know that in all these, you know, like in a team or whatever, there are these silos developed. You know, and, and you played in the NFL, I'm sure that that, you know, between offense and defense and the different teams, there are these different silos that develop where, and maybe there's friction points and antagonisms. But if you look at it like, hey, how can we do the best to cover and move for each other? How can we do the best to support each other and put the overall goal of the team 
or the company or my fire department first or my family, then we're all going to win. Right. And so that, you know, that involves checking your ego and looking to see where you can help other folks so they can they can win do because it's going to come back to you because when the team wins, everybody wins. Right. And, um, you know, how, how does this apply to your family? We all know and you've experienced this where you'll get to a point with your kids and you got to this with your parents where at some point you just shut them off. Like they're telling you great stuff, but they're just like, whap, whap, whap. You're not, you're not hearing it. Whereas there are probably like a school teacher or a coach or a, an uncle or an aunt or, you know, maybe a scout leader that's saying the same stuff to your kids, but they're listening to them because it's just coming from a different angle. So you want to basically cover and move and have a teamwork with everybody around you to help help raise those kids. I mean, it, it, it down to like even between you and your spouse, there are times where you've got to pick up some slack and maybe you're doing some of, some of her chores for her um, in order just to, to help everything get done. So that's the first law of combat. Second law of combat is simple. Um, and that means like, hey, we got to look at the overall mission and goal and say, what is it? What's the overall mission of goal, or goal of, of what we're trying to do? And, and what's the, the way to communicate that in the simplest terms necessary? Like, what does winning look like? Um, and, you know, for football on the offensive side, that means that you're going to get that football across the end zone. And But for the defense, it's different, right? They're trying to stop the other team from doing it and, and hopefully push it back as far as they can so they can get it. So when everybody knows, hey, that's what our overall end state or our goal is, then they can problem solve at their level. Third law of combat is prioritize and execute. And this, this, this seems ridiculously like so simple. Why would you even bring it up? But it's, it's simple, but it isn't easy. You need to be able to look at everything that you've got going on and say, what is the number one priority and deal with that. And in order to do that, you need to detach from the detail sometimes and you got to detach from emotion other times. Like if I'm in a firefight and my buddy gets shot, emotionally, I want to stop what I'm doing and start treat, d- d- applying medical treatment to him. But that's not my priority in a firefight. My priority is to finish the firefight. Because if I don't finish the firefight and suppress enemy fire, then I could have seven more buddies that I'm going to have to treat if I stop doing that. Now, the medic, his his priority is to get over to apply medical stuff, but it's an internal struggle. And this can happen all the time. And it's super difficult for leaders where you can get sucked into details, especially when you promote it up through a job and you know the job of everybody beneath you real well. It's really difficult for you to not get sucked into those details and not that then you lose sight of the big picture and that's your job. And so like on the battlefield, the, the, as a SEAL leader, that detail that you can get sucked into is the front sight on your weapon, right? If I'm out there and I'm a leader in a SEAL platoon, there are absolutely times when I'm probably going to have to shoot my gun, but when I'm shooting my gun, my, my, my peripheral vision is completely gone. All I'm focused on is this, you know, this little soda straw, of stuff and there's a lot going on in the battlefield and I need to keep in mind that my actual weapon system is the other 17 seals that are out there fighting. And so I need to be up and looking around and take a step back and be able to get that 30,000 foot view to say, hey, we're taking fire from over there. Maybe needing to move this building. Hey, is is our medevac support here? Do I have all the assets that I need right now to support what we got going on And, and, and that kind of stuff. So, but I tell you, I like to shoot. I was a sniper. And so I can get sucked into that front sight and completely lose track of time and what's going on. And then I've, I've, at that point, I've lost it. So, so I'm not saying that you need to be at the 30,000 foot view all the time, but you need to be able to cycle back and forth because there are absolutely times on the battlefield where I need to, to be on my weapon and shooting it. I just need to know it's not my priority to back up. So prioritize and execute. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, it, from, from a family level. Maybe your kid's struggling in school. And then if that's the case, then you need to look at any sports that they might be in and say, hey, is, is this actually a priority for us right now? Or is the kid getting good grades a bigger priority? Weigh that out and then focus your efforts where they need to be focused based on what you think the priority is. I mean, there are conditions where the, 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 the kid's athletic ability, it may be that like, hey, we're not gonna stop the sport because this is gonna be your ticket to higher education and we're gonna get you a stinking couple tutors if that's what we need to do to get your grades up to the level where you can continue playing, right? So all that needs to be balanced out, but in order to do it, you need to be able to detach and look back and look at all the priorities that are going on. Um, you know, when I, I, didn't, I didn't cover on simple where that applies to the family, but it does, you know, for, for Iris and I, my wife, uh, about a year ago, we, we were like, hey, what does winning look like for us as parents? And we decided that winning looks like that we're raising kind, confident, competent adults. And so now that we both have agreed on that as parents, we can move forward. And then as we problem solve and we run into different parenting challenges, we're like, well, I'm trying to raise a competent adult. So for instance, my daughter climbed up an apple tree last year and then starts crying that she can't get down. And I would, I would just love to come be a white knight and rescue her. But then that begs the question, am I making a competent adult by rescuing my child? The answer is no. So, but what I can do is I can go over to the apple tree and coach her down so she can make it over that obstacle on her own. Now I'm making a competent, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road to making a competent adult that way. And I'm thinking that because I, we, we came up with what our simple was for, per, uh, for parenting. What does winning look like? And then the final law of combat is um, <clears throat> the, the fourth law is decentralized command. And this is a situation where everybody is leading. So it takes the first three laws of combat overlaid with each other so that, you know, you've got teamwork going on within your organization. You, everyone understand what's the overall mission of goal is and they understand what winning looks like. And then they're going, okay, we know. And, and then they're able to prioritize and execute and problem solve at their level. So even if they're not leading anybody but themselves, they know what the goal is and they can figure things out and get them done. And so as a leader, you're constantly pushing to this point where you're trying to work yourself out of a job. Now, I, obviously there, as a leader, there are decisions that have to come to your level. And there really shouldn't be that many decisions. You should be pushing as much down to your people as possible. Um, in the SEAL teams, we had what's called the Commander's Commit Critical Information Requirements, CCIRs. And there weren't many of them, there was four, right? It was like, hey, if someone's killed or wounded in the battlefield, as soon as you finish that firefight and you communicate that back up the chain of command, um, you're gonna do it. And if the commanding officer's asleep, we're going to wake him up if one of these four things happens. So somebody's killed or wounded. The second thing was, hey, if there are any civilian casualties or allegations of civilian casualties, we're letting the CEO know at our first available time. And then the third one was any press involvement. If there's any press involvement, good or bad, first opportunity, we're letting the commanding officer know and he's getting woken up for it. And the last one was, if anyone back in the state, so any of our, our dependents from our, you know, of, of, of our family members that are back there, if they're in the hospital or otherwise laid up, as soon as the, the as soon as we are, uh, we can let the CEO know, we're, we're letting him know for that information. Everything else, We've got his guidance. He told us what winning looks like. He told us, hey, here are the parameters that you're working under. And, and you've got to do that for decentralized command to work. Everyone needs to understand what their roles and responsibilities are and what winning looks like. And then they can operate inside that stuff. And then they know, and then they know this is what we push up. This is what we push up. Hey, boss, you know, there was a reporter out in the field today. He, he was taking some pictures here, how, how, how we think it went. And, and let them know. And then all the other stuff, we just tell them at regularly scheduled meetings. So 
decentralized command is why it's why the Marines were able to clear the Japanese who were entrenched on every island in the Pacific and waiting for them. Because they would come up with a major plan, and as soon as it started and things changed, they adapted with it, and it was pushed all the way down to that Marine Corps private carrying a rifle on how he was going to take out that next Japanese pillbox, whether he was going to do a frontal assault or maybe he was going to sneak around and throw a grenade through the side. And that is so powerful, and it's the best way for any organization to operate because they can make decisions really fast. If everyone's coming to me as a leader to make decisions, it slows the hell out of the process, and then it boxes the process into, hey, we're just going to solve the problems based on how Jason thinks about it, as opposed to everybody else's problem solving, and now I'm going to get some real innovation going on because I've got new people looking at the problem as, as long as they're operating inside the parameters that we've given them, you know, as long as it's legal, ethical, and safe, they're going to come up with new ways to get things done, which is amazing. So those, those are the four laws of combat. Um, and that's really what, you know, our, our whole talk is about. And then we've got some mindset for victory that we talk about as well. Um, but yeah, so just don't want to run. No, I'm, I mean, it sounds amazing. I'm just, uh, as you're reflecting on it, um, I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, the war we've been in for the last two decades and nobody ever defined what victory was or, or what victory looked like. And as I'm listening to this, I'm like, I wish that the people, when we decided this thing, like day one, George Bush gets up, like what did victory look like? I mean, we went over there to fight the war on terror, which felt so open-ended. Like, I mean, and maybe I'm just not privy to it, but. I, uh, I was always confused a little oh, bit. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm like, boy, I wish we had given those. Uh, I wish you'd given this information to the people before we started this war, because it, it always feels like when we start these wars, it's kind of this abstract idea. We're going to fight the war on terror. Yeah, and then then it just kind of it grew a life of its own. Um, you know, in the post Vietnam era, there was always like a heavy stress, hey, we're going in here, what is our extra strategy and what does winning look like? And they, they knew that going into Iraq um, and things just went sideways and then we weren't able to get unstuck from that tar bait, right? Where, uh, uh, you know, once you touch it with one hand, then you're stuck with the other hand. And then, you know, especially like us getting ready to pull out of Afghanistan, Folks were like, well, we've already we've already spilled a lot of blood there. Can we leave now? But then the question is also, and it's a valid question, it's like, do we throw good money after bad money? And maybe the answer is no. And 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 you're right, the the policy from the top should have been a lot clearer. Um, I'm always hesitant to look at, at the world from from now, now, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Of course. Of and course. still, but we never know what paths things might have gone on had we not gone into Iraq or had we not gone into an Afghanistan. And so... But when we went into debate. Iraq, there there was a clear defined deal when we went into Iraq. I mean, hey, we're going to take out Saddam Hussein. We're going to, you know, dismantle this. And when we went into Afghanistan, I felt like, you know, hey, they were going after Al-Qaeda and all these other different uh, groups. But it just... Like after a while, I'm like, you know, like it, it uh, and maybe this is just me looking at it from the outside as not a military person, but I always think if we're going to go fight a war, everybody should be on the same page on what victory looks like. You know, wars of yeah. occupation yeah. tend to be just yeah. transfers of wealth. I mean, so like, you know, like, okay, we're going to occupy this for what? Right. Yeah. And, and we got into the, it seemed like we got into a, a nation building type of thing, which they're, I mean, that's good because look at what happened in Syria. Yeah. Like ISIS came out of Syria, which was just a huge debacle. And so that's why I'm hesitant to say, well, what would have happened had we not gone into Afghanistan where you have these big messes. Um, and I think like there's a huge mess in Libya right now. And that could be a place that generates a bunch of pain in, in the future too. So we did get into that nation building. I mean, the nation building worked out really well for us with Germany and Japan. Sure. Um, 
but it it hasn't seemed to work out very well with us in in Iraq and maybe Iraq is it's I mean they've dealt with ISIL and hopefully things are stabilized there for now we'll see well the uh, uh, if you go back I mean you know back beyond the Bible I mean that part of the world I mean I don't know if they've ever known peace all they know is war I mean uh, just doing a little bit of reading on like the on what the Russians experienced in Afghanistan and their level of brutality was like legendary beyond and they couldn't break those people. So I'm always thinking nope. like how, how many people, and you would know as a historian much better than I, but how many different groups have gone in and tried to, uh, tried to conquer Afghanistan and gone in a fight of war there that have ended up leaving? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that the Brits wound up being the most successful there. I know Alexander the Great thought he was going to be in and out of there in three months and that three years later he was still there or two years later he was there for a lot longer. Um, and... It, Again, Afghanistan in the 70s was a very, it was, it was fairly squared away and um, very Western, as, as was Iran. Yeah, the um, pictures are insane uh, to show colleges and girls walking around in skirts. I love seeing those pictures of those places. Like, what changed? Like, yeah. how did that, how did it go from, like, a place that we would go, uh, you know, study abroad to what it is today? So, I think you had the, the breakdown of of colonialism where the Brits and the French had set up these arbitrary borders. And then from my understanding, when you're going to control a population that outnumbers you, you constantly pit the population against it. If you're an imperial power, right? So they would go to somewhere in Iraq that's mostly Shia, and then they would put Sunnis in charge. And then they, in oh, like over in um, Syria, is mostly Sunni and they put the Alawites of the Shia in charge there. And so, and then they just have the arbitrary lines that were borders that really didn't represent the, how everything was laid out there. And I think there was a lot of angst over that. And there was a lot of uh, um, leaders that were just not treating their people well and they got pissed off and, uh, grows up and then, then then that's where these really radical ideas took hold or, or grabbed hold of all that angst that was among the people and and took over and uh i don't know uh the the the, the truth of the matter is though to trajectory wise the world's getting better the world is becoming less violent than it has been in the past so we're we're it's, it's definitely a sine wave as we move in that direction but it's getting better, and, and I think, I think that as bad as social media is, there's a lot of good stuff to it too. A lot of good stuff with people being able to communicate, and it'll move us towards freedom. And as we move towards freedom, there, there is there, there's it's inevitable that there will be violent outbreaks. I mean, at some point, the people in North Korea are going to figure out they're, they've been duped all this time. And that's not going to be good when they come for the people leaving there. I, um, whenever people talk about North Korea, um, do you, um, you know Kevin Fields? He was no. the, um, yeah, so I, I did uh, uh, some contracting stuff with the guys over on, uh, in Hawaii for the SEAL delivery vehicles, and he was their um, mm -hmm. command master chief. So I got to hang out with him a bunch. And uh, he's like, you know, um, just to give you an idea on North Korea, he goes, we have satellite images of those guys raking the beach every night at dusk and then they walk the beach looking for footprints he's like the entire coastline he goes it's crazy to see you know thousands of these dudes just raking the beach and he goes just that, that's the level of neurotic and insanity we're dealing with and i, I always remember that little thing with uh, north korea and i'm like yeah i mean that's a that's a scary place too yeah i just heard uh, a podcast um with this young lady who'd escaped north korea and 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 essentially the whole dang country is a concentration. Everybody's spying on everybody else. It's, 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 it's horrible. It's a horrible situation. And, it, and there's, there's a bunch of, there's words in their language. They've modified the language. They don't even have certain words just to keep people down. Um, but it's not gonna last forever. And when people finally wake up and they realize that they can, you know, when, when people can talk to each other without filters, then they're going to wake up to it um and then it's very likely that 
the government over there is going to overreact and, and that's going to be costly, but the, the end trajectory is we're moving in the right direction. Now that you're teaching I, leadership, do you feel that it's easier to use past negative examples from history or experience or direct towards more positive examples of how this worked and we had success? So I feel like it's most impactful when I share with people my mistakes because it's, it's first of all, it's like, hey, here's where I messed something up. And, um, and really, when you do something right, what do you learn? You haven't really learned much. It's when you fail and when you make a mistake that you actually learn, it's like, oh, that hurt. I'm going to do that a little different this time. So I, I would say that, that the past failures and in, 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 I don't like to point out other people's failures. I point out my personal failures where I failed and learned from them and then use that examples in my brief. And, that, and there's an example I give in, in the brief when I talk about humility about um, an op we did in Afghanistan. And it was late in my deployment in 2009 to Afghanistan. And uh, um, up until that point in the, the deployment, every time we got in the firefight with the Taliban, we did the meat stop on them. I mean, we had better weapons, we had better training, we had night vision, we had air support. So we started to get cocky. I started to get complacent. And then we went on this one operation where we were going to get this Taliban commander in his, in, in his village uh, north of Kandahar up in the mountains and uh, gets inserted by a helicopter. We did like a three kilometer offset patrol up and over a mountain range down to hit this guy's compounds that are on the edge of the village. And right next to the compounds is like this big hill that's about like the size of a four story building. And we always, cause we're gonna remain over day. We'd always like to snatch up a piece of high ground. Well, the thing about fighting in the mountains is you can grab one piece of high ground and they can just grab all the high ground around you, right? So we grab this piece of high ground, our assault force goes down, they take down the two compounds, they find immediately a huge cache of weapons, demo, um, uranium, the uranium sat phones, a couple of different of, uh, of uh, um, passports from the same guy. So it's like, and, and we had the Taliban commander who caught him too. And so we're like, okay, so up on this piece of high ground that I'm at, our standard operating procedure was every guy had to carry um, 10 empty sandbags with them so you could make yourself a fighting position for when the sun came up and the fighting started. So we start trying to fill sandbags up on the high ground. We get like two filled and then there's no sand because it's essentially it's a rock mountain. I mean, imagine being out in the parking lot of, of a Trader Joe's and you're trying to fill a sandbag. It's not happening. So we're, we're cobbling together all these boulders and rocks. So we're rolling rocks over and two guys are carrying boulders over. We make ourselves a janky fighting position that is like, you know, the wall's about mid thigh high on me and we're all crammed in this thing. It's like maybe 15 or maybe 15 yards long by five yards deep. Sun comes up, women and children all leave the village. And that's the indicator that it's going to get hot, but they don't, they don't attack us straight away. Women and children leave. And then, you know, an hour goes by nothing. Two hours go by nothing. And we're like, huh? And what the, they, what the Taliban did was, they took their time and figured out the two compounds we were in. They could see us up on that high ground. And then they started pushing up into all the high ground around us. And it took them a couple hours. And so by like, oh, it was like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. We're sitting up in, in, in that fighting position. And, and in this hillside, about 1,200 yards away, we can see this guy pushing a PKM, which is a big belt-fed machine gun, out onto a flat piece of rock. And so we shoot at him with a 300 wind max sniper rifle, right? The winds are blowing really high. We're missing. It's a 1,200 yard shot. It's about at the boundaries of the capability of that round. And we miss him by like eight inches. And he pulls his the, the machine gun back and hides in whatever cave or whatever he's in, and then then starts pushing it back out again. And so we're playing this game with him over the next like two hours, and it starts to get hotter and hotter. And so the first thing is everyone takes off their helmets. And the next thing that happened is everybody, me included, takes off our body on. Now think of this. We're shooting at a guy with a machine gun and because it's hot and we're a little uncomfortable,
comfortable, we decide to take off our body armor and helmets. That is arrogant and it's complacent and it's just not good. So round about, you know, it's about 11, 15, they're all set up and they hit us with this massive barrage of rocket propelled grenades and just come soaring in from, and it just seemed like from us, like these things were coming from every direction. And the same thing was happening, like a bunch of them came our, our position on the high ground, same thing down for the guys in the compound. Now they were able to fill sandbags. So up on the rooftops, they've got sandbag positions in, but because these rocket propelled grenades and machine gun rounds are coming in from an elevated position, they got to bail off those rooftop positions. We're just laying down. I'm laying there and I'm looking up at the rock wall that's about this high over my head and I'm watching it physically start to erode under the bullet impacts. And, uh, and so I'm thinking to myself, it's like, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get killed today. Um, at a bare minimum, I don't see uh, how I don't get shot. I snake my way back in my body armor. I get my helmet back on my head. I got my rifle. I go to peek my head up over that wall. And I'll tell you what. I would no sooner put my face into a spinning table saw than I was putting my face up over that wall because it was just getting torn up with bullets. The only aircraft we had overhead was a, a Predator. And it's got, it's the Predator is a UAV, so there's not a guy in it. It's, the person flying it is back in, 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 a, in a, you know, in a, in a trailer somewhere either in country or in Nevada or something like that. And they're looking at the battle space through a thermal image. Well, the problem is, is it's 30,000 feet up and thermal image of the battle space where everybody's essentially the same temperature as the rocks. They can't pick people out. Plus the Taliban got all these countermeasures they use to uh, like hide from our thermal imagers. So they'll use like wet blankets and different little tricks to hide. So they, they can't pick anybody else out. Um, meanwhile, the compounds below us, they're starting, the, because there's hardly any windows in the compound walls, they got guys close enough to them that they're lobbing grenades over the walls and they had to use their breaching charges to blow holes in the walls so they could see out to shoot the Taliban that was about to overrun their position. And so they're barely holding their own down there. And as soon as they're gone, we're next, you know, because we're just up on this high ground. Then our SATCOM antenna gets shot in the base. And another lazy, complacent, stupid thing that we did was we set up our antenna outside of our fighting position. And so the task unit commander, he vaults over the wall, runs through this crazy hail of bullets. I don't know how he didn't get shot. It was like Pulp Fiction. Grabs the SATCOM antenna, brings it back in, and then gets it set back up and reestablishes cause. At this point, every aircraft in Afghanistan is coming as fast as it can to our position because we told them over the radio, like, you know, hey, it, we're, we're probably going to get overrun. Um, the first two fast, first two aircraft to get there are a couple of French Mirages. And our, our, our Joint Tactical Air Controller, the guy who works with Kirk Parsley right now, um, great, 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 great fella, um, Henry Berkowitz. I'm going to say his name because I know he'd be good with it. And so he does a really smart thing. Yeah, he's no, right Henry's come and trained with us. Uh, we know Henry. He's trained with us a bunch of times. Solid dude. So Henry's awesome. And, and it, there's Henry is a new guy, all right? So this is first Henry's first deployment, and Henry is making these decisions and making these calls like a stinking seasoned combat vet. I love Henry. So what Henry does, because he knows he can't tell these guys to bomb anything because we our heads haven't been up. We don't know where the position's at. So Henry tells the French, the French uh, Mirage pilots, he's like, hey, I need you guys to give me a show of force over these two main ridge lines because they were set up on these two ridge lines where we were taking fire from. And, and so a couple of minutes later, the French pilots come back over the radio and they go, ho, 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 stand by, here we come. And they're barreling over these ridge lines, super low. <laughs> As they're going, they're kicking off these IR flares that are there to confuse any like heat seeking, you know, stinger missiles or whatever the, the enemy might have that might take the aircraft down. Well, what this does is this is cover and move. It forces the Taliban to get their heads down because they hate our aircraft. So they put their heads down and now we can get up. Now I can get my head up over the wall, all of us, and we can start shooting back. 
And now we've got a decent idea of where they are. So we're laying suppressive fire down and we're launching the guys down the compounds have got a mortar set up and we're pumping mortars back and forth. And now the firefight is raging, but we're like 30 kilometers from near Fort, Fort operating base. We don't have an endless supply of ammo. Um, and so while it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to get overrun, we're, you know, we, we got maybe an hour's lot left of ammo at this point. And then, and then a B-1 bomber checked on stage. And B-1 bombers have bombs to waste. And as Henry was talking to that pilot, her voice, it was like an angel when she says, I'm going to drop 4,000 pounds of ordnance for you. I'm going to give you eight 500-pound bombs, four on each ridgeline, airburst 50 meters off the deck, 100 meters apart. And she said it all as coolly and calmly as if she was saying, hey, Jay, I'm running down to Starbucks. You want that dirty chai latte you always get? And so then she says, weapons release. 30 seconds to impact because the B-1 bomber can do all that at the same time. And then Henry gives us a 10 second to one countdown over the inner squad comms. And then it's just like, boom, 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 boom. All these bombs, four over each ridge line, eight total. It's like the 4th of July. I mean, everybody was cheering. Except for the Taliban, they didn't cheer because <laughs> out there that day but still there were a few of them in in so it was a low level firefight um and then it, it got hot up in that fighting position we didn't have any shade and we ran out of water at two o'clock in the afternoon and it was 112 degrees out and we we didn't get water until um you know after it got dark and they were able to come in with helicopters and kick off some resupply pallets with uh more food and water and all that stuff. So, you know, that was a great, great lesson in humility for me. I mean, there was never a time again after that in my career where I ever went anywhere without 24 hours worth of water. It was like, oh yeah, we're just gonna go over here. We'll only be out for two hours. Yep, always carrying 24 hours worth of water because that sucked. And then never again was I that lazy that I took off my body armor and helmet. And so that that's a story that I, I love to share and it's a great, representation of humility you know because we we'd lost it we'd done so good for so long that we got that victory disease we started to get arrogant we got complacent you know i mean i should have had a plan on what i was going to do if i wasn't able to fill sandbags because afghanistan was essentially just a big dang rock pile and it was obvious that i was going to run into that it was just i got lazy and didn't think about it you know, and, and after that, what did we do? Well, we started taking 40 pound crater in charges with us. And when we were in these up high, high ground positions, we would just blow ourselves in giant fighting positions that were awesome. I mean, they would be like condominiums. We would be up there with plenty of food and water and we'd have a shade structure built up and plenty of cover to shoot back. It was great. And I should have thought about that from the front, but, but I'd lost my humility, you know? And, and, and that humility is a funny thing because a lot of folks will mistake humility with meekness and humility is not meekness. Humility is just understanding that you always have room to improve. You always have something to learn. You can always do better. And then with big business, do you find humility is one of the most difficult things to teach? Is that why it's listed number four in that decentralized command and, and give? Well, yeah, I mean, Humility is, is actually listed under one of our mindsets for victory, but sure, it's, it's the biggest thing in any organization when you've been doing well for a while, like how do you stay humble so you don't, you don't get, you, you know, collapse? Because the, the thing that you might do, the instinct to do is like, hey, this works, why would we change it? And this is what we've always done. Why wouldn't we do better? And, you know, you talk about big business. Where where the heck is Blockbuster Video today? Right? They're ghost gone. town. I, yeah, I was going to say, go, like, I, I, on some I, I, weird I, trading I, thing on Reddit. <laughs> they, they still have, like, a storefront maybe in, in Oregon. But they, I mean, they had the market share on home entertainment. 
and they yeah. could have bought Netflix. Uh, Netflix tried to sell them, and they were like, no, 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 people always want to do DVDs. So, I mean, is that, is that humility, or is that just lack of leadership and, and uh, you know, foresight? Just no vision to see where the market's pivoting. I mean, I think the same thing happens in warfare, um, or at least, you know, I imagine, like, you know, you have this one idea, and then everything's so malleable that it's changing at such a rapid pace that if you don't have some form of vision and foresight to be able to be able to be agile enough to be able to move and make changes. I think that's what I've always appreciated about the SEAL teams uh, where every, you guys were always small enough to be able to move and learn new things and constantly pushing the boundaries. Whereas if you look at like, you know, we worked with big army. I mean, to get those guys to move, was like trying to turn a battleship. Yeah. And, and that, that is the secret to our success in the SEAL teams is doctrinally we we're not tied down and that's why we've been able to innovate and adapt and have built so well and just it there's a feedback loop that we have in the seal team so every time we do something um we debrief it we're like hey what did we do wrong what did we do right what could we do better next time and everybody has a voice at that debrief so when you're in a, in a room debriefing the rank comes off and <clears throat> And it's, it's really important to check your ego because it may be that that new guy has got, he's seeing stuff from a different angle and he may be bring up that thing that's going to bring you to the next level and help you adjust. Um, and we've seen that with our tactics. And that there's a natural Darwinian approach that makes you adjust on the battlefield because when an enemy changes their tactics, if you don't adapt to them, guess what? You die. And unfortunately in business, Things don't happen that fast and the results aren't as drastic. And so the ability to change is, it's not as immediate or relevant. And so it, it takes a little bit of time and it takes, it takes you actually thinking about it and going, Hey, where, what, what, where can we do things better? Where are things going? Um, and that's it. And, and, and it's, 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 it's more difficult in big organizations because when you do get a big organization, you're forced to build up these bureaucracies to get the thing moving. Where does ego come into play in all this? I mean, Everywhere. we've talked, we've talked uh, humility and uh, whenever people start talking about humility, I always think like, uh, you know, especially in uh, like probably the level you're at, I mean, with this like huge egos, big personalities, um, and the one thing that I found, especially in the NFL, I'm sure you found is sometimes the bigger the ego, the more people cling to that for their identity. So how does that come into play? I mean, ego is, comes into play everywhere you look. If you're having a hard time, like cover and move and you're working with some other team or whatever, or department, you've got to check your ego instead of just blaming them and saying they're doing a crappy job. You have to check your ego and say, Hey, what can I do better to support what they're doing? How can I help them? I mean, you know, as far as it's simple, you may, you may think that you're a great communicator. And the reality is, is like, I may communicate with you in one way and you can pick it up. And I try to say something to text and he needs to hear it completely different for him to understand it. And so I need to be able to check my ego in that case in, in, in order to, you know, figure out what text needs to hear as far as communicating what the overall mission or goal is. I mean, it is everywhere. And that's the checking your ego is the biggest battle that all of us will ever fight and just being better humans. And it's, it's a balance in it, isn't it? Because it's that ego that's making you strive to do better. It's, it's that ego that's, that's asking you to, 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 to have a better, better deadlift or be a better person. But it's also that ego that you need to keep in check, because, because it, because it can it and it can poison you. Um, the more you, the higher you get up in leadership, the more you need to check your ego, and the more you need to 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 listen, in order to be a more effective leader. It's everywhere, and there's not a simple answer for it. And um, as as I pull the string on it, you know, as I, I've been thinking about leadership and just being a better person that uh, every day I'm, I'm learning something new about about that ego and, and how I need to keep it in check. And you mentioned be 
training yourself to be a better person, did these rules and lessons start to change when you direct it inward for a personal accountability? Or do you see similar that you're expressing to during your lessons outward when you are the leader versus internal adjustments and taking this to personal accountability expansion? Yeah, that's a great question. And absolutely. I'm always implying something internally. You know, the first thing I'm doing is like, hey, am I am I covering moving with my teammates right? Am I am I doing a good job of covering moving? Have I really thought to myself, what does winning look like? Um, you know, what where where do I want to be in 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 five years? And today, am I prioritizing and executing? Am I, and what are the three main things that I want to knock out today? And then as I start to get more, more input and I get emails and phone calls, then I have to weigh those against the priorities that I have stacked for myself for today. And then, you know, the decentralized command thing, that's a little bit different to internalize. That's kind of pushed outward most of the time. That, that, that's what I'm thinking like, hey, am I empowering my family and my kids and my team to be able to operate and get things done? You know, and then, then we've got, you know, like we talk about the mindsets for victory, whereas like we talk about default aggressive, which is that that needs a little explanation. Default aggressive is not about me getting inside someone's 18 inch bubble and knife hitting them and yelling. Default aggressive is not me sending out an email in all caps and in red. Default aggressive is about me taking a hard look at, hey, what do I need to get done today? And then actually doing something about it. And the things that you most need to do in your life are in the places that you least want to look, right? And so, so the things that you least want to do are usually that things that you, you probably should be doing. And so that would, that default aggressive is what gets you into the gym on the days that you really don't feel like. And default aggressive is what forces you to sit down and make sure that your insurance is all squared away. So if something happens to you that your family's taken care of, you know, all of those little things that you want to don't, don't really want to do is that's what helps you do it, you know? And then we also talk about discipline equals freedom, which discipline is being disciplined about those little things that you don't want to do. But if you're disciplined with your money, then you have financial freedom. And if you're disciplined with how you manage your time, then you'll find you have more free time. And so those mindsets for victory with default aggressive, discipline equals freedom, humility, which, which I hammered pretty hard already, and uh, being able to innovate and adapt and looking at new ways to do things. Um, those are all things that we talk about too when we teach and then I try to internalize it and, and do a better job of it. You know, and the final thing is, is like extreme ownership. The, that concept of, hey, there is no complaining. There is no excuse making. There is only me. What can I do to make this problem better? And so, I'm not going to point the finger at somebody else and saying they're not doing their job. Instead, I'm going to go, well, hey, it seems like they're having a hard time doing their job. What can I do to set them up for success? Maybe my team missed the deadline. Well, I better look at, did I give them enough time to get the job done? Did I give them enough resources to get the job done? Or did I train them up to the level that they needed to, to be able to get the job done on that deadline? And then maybe, and this is the last case, maybe there's a team member that is just not making it up to our standard and they need to be cut away from the team. And have I done that? And that's how I take extreme ownership of everything. And so I check my ego, I don't cast blame, but I look at, hey, how can I solve this problem? Um, you know, this is something that the, the Stoics talked about a great deal. People have been talking about these concepts in different ways for a long time back in history. And Leif and Jocko captured it and put it in a way for us to easy to understand in the present day that's super helpful. And it's really the foundation of everything that we talk about at S1 Front is extreme ownership. How can I solve these problems? Where does discipline come in? And I, uh, I wonder if you go and you speak with these corporate groups uh, is, you know, discipline, self-discipline, the discipline to not only keep yourself in shape and do the things that you do, but like, how does that enter into the conversation? Um, I imagine, you know, you going in and speaking to 
uh, a large corporation where people come from all different walks of life, um, you know, they probably look and think, oh, this one's easy for you. You're a Navy SEAL. But how do you break that down and uh, give people something tangible to work with? Um, I still get up and train every day because it's what I've done since I was 14 years old to play in the NFL. And the day that I don't do that, I feel yeah. like I, I get, you start getting away from who you are as an individual because it's so ingrained in the identity. I wonder for people in corporate America who prob- who don't have that background or that experience, especially from where you come from, how do you uh, convey them that idea of discipline and uh, you know, like it's not sexy, it's just consistent. Yeah, so I, I mean, I talk about it in, in that the idea of discipline is doing those little things that you know you need to be doing and they're just like, they're hard to do and so maybe you don't do them. And so I talk about that the opposite of discipline equals freedom is that procrastination equals pain. And this is what I did in, in high school. I get assigned a paper due in two weeks and instead of being disciplined about it and maybe spending 40 minutes a night working on it and getting it turned in on time, I would follow the procrastination equal pain, which meant that I would tell myself, ah, I'll start working on it tomorrow, but worry about it. And then not, and, and so the whole two weeks I'm worried about it until the Thursday night. And then right around 7 p.m., I actually start on the dang paper and finish at two in the morning, which is painful and then hand it up and and get like a C minus on the dang paper, you know, where had I done a disciplined approach to it, it, I would have just knocked it, knocked it out in a little bit. And so, you know, when, when you talk to corporate America and I'm talking to people in businesses and we're talking about like, Hey, how do you do team building exercises? And folks ask this question. It's a great question. It's like, you can build team and camaraderie in the military by going out and doing something really hard go out and just do a really hard operation where we're going over the horizon through some big surf. And then we're going to patrol in like five kilometers and hit a big target and patrol out. And it's going to be like 27 hours long and it's going to suck. Well, how does someone in a business that, you know, maybe they have disabled people working for them and people that just, they're not not that kind of people. How do they do it? Well, then they, they, you, you look at things that are, aren't outside out of the physical but you look at different goals that you can set and you're like hey gang here's here's something that we've got going on and and maybe there there's a report that takes x amount of time and we're going to see if we can knock out getting this report done or this research done or this excel spreadsheet done or this program written in this amount of time and we're going to get the whole team fired up about it. And we're going to see how everybody can do it because there's all these little parts and pieces that fit into that, that take discipline. And that's, that's how it's going to work. Um, you know, when I was a command master chief of a SEAL team and, and even when I was ops master chief, I had a secret safe in my office and that's where my secret hard drive was kept. And on top of it is this piece of paper that I've got to sign the safe open and initial with my initials in the morning when I open it. And then I got assigned when it's, when it's locked close at the end of the day, takes like 30 seconds. And, and of course I never did it. And then every two years you get an admin inspection at a SEAL team where they look at all the process that you're doing administratively. So guess what that meant? That meant that I was stuck at work until 10 o'clock at night gun decking a bunch of those papers you know with like two colored pens and trying to make it look realistic so that i would pass the inspection and i was like this is dumb and so then i just started every morning i come in hey it takes me a second open the safe sign the things open put the date and then i'm good so then when the admin inspection comes up guess where i'm at at 10 p.m at night i'm home in bed i've been bed at home since like 5 p.m at dinner with my family it's great but I was just disciplined about that little thing that, ah, uh, maybe I was, maybe I didn't agree with it, but I got to do it. So I just did it, you know? And so. How long did it take you, you to learn that find, lesson? At, at what age did you learn that lesson? <laughs> one, one time was sitting there till 10 PM. Uh, how old that were stuff. you? How old? Oh, I was like 42. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, like. Uh, you know, this, this, lessons I'm learning you know, all the time. Yeah, and get it done at two in the morning. And I'm like, well, okay. So then I tried that and I ended up not getting as good a grade. 
And I was like, oh, fuck, this fucked me up. Never again. (laughs) So I sometimes wonder if like these experiences, but as you're talking, I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was stupid enough to do that. No. And and you know what? Here's the deal, too. As you get older, the, the ramifications of your actions are a lot more painful. (laughs) <laughs> right like I, when you were younger you i i couldn't power through being up till two in the morning and then come in and, and function pretty decently the next day and, and now that that that's painful you know yeah. i used to be able to drink quite a bit and then still function pretty good the next day and then now i just can't you know i can't do that and and you're able to, to step back and get the bigger view and, and slow down a lot that um you know shoot well, the, uh, uh, we had um, Craig Douglas, uh, who's a you know, uh, private sector kind of teaches like some really close interesting combat, like, close combat yeah. stuff. And so we had him on the podcast, and uh, he's 53, and he's like, you know, uh, my girlfriend and I are thinking of having a kid. And I like, looked at him, and I was like, first time, huh? He's like, yeah. I'm like, having children is a young man's game. 53 is going to be interesting because uh, yeah. sleep deprivation is a real deal. Um, I, I didn't have my kids until I was in my early 30s. But I always I mm. joke with my wife, uh, I wish we had met and had kids in my early 20s because I didn't need to sleep. Like I could rock the yeah. bar, close it, drive the facility, fall asleep in my car, get up and go play. And we played games hung over and kicked ass and like just felt like I was Superman. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're in your 30s and now you've been up for like two weeks straight, you know, with kids because I had twins and uh, it aged me in dog years. So, yeah, we had twins the first time out the gate. So I didn't sleep any more than about 45 minutes for about the first three months. So I, it's, it's an interesting thing that you mentioned. I, I had my oldest boy, I think I was 25 or 26 years old. And then I, I haven't, you know, I, I, that marriage, we wound up getting divorced and then I'm remarried and, and uh, my daughter's 10 and my son is nine. And so, you know, I was in my forties when I had them and I found that being older, um, when I was younger, having a kid is kind of a burden. And then when you're older, it's more of a blessing. And you were probably right in between that in, in, in your thirties where you, uh, you have a little bit more money, you have more patience and you have more time. And so it's, it's been a better experience all the way around. I mean, I've been a much better father for my younger kids than, um, my oldest boy got out of me. No, I've said the exact same thing. I think I would have been a shitty father in my twenties. Because uh, at, at that time in your life, you're so selfish. I mean, I was playing in the NFL, and the, it's such a selfish lifestyle. Uh, I'm sure very similar yeah. for you guys with deployments and this and wartime and here and like to see the impact on families. Um, so the interesting thing, probably very similar to the SEAL teams, uh, when I came in as a young guy, all the older guys were all divorced and going through these like horrific like uh, you know uh, court cases and this. And I just would like sitting around talking with these older guys who weren't necessarily older. They were like in their late 20s and 30s. Like the the financial issues and this and kids and I remember the one of the dudes is like don't get married this game doesn't work very well with with uh, with what if, if you're gonna get married you want it to last wait till you get done and so I didn't get married yeah. until I left the NFL just because of the uh, like <laughs> what I saw as a young dude and um, I'm sure very similar for you know for you guys in terms of your jobs um, you know it's so encompassing that it makes it hard to be able to you know, balance yourself to be able to be a good dad and a good husband and, and be able to do your job at the, you know, fucking hundred miles an hour. Yeah. It, it really, cause I mean, essentially when you do a 30 year career like me, it, I, I didn't really want to wait that long to get married, but you're absolutely right. It is an environment which is not conducive to success and the divorce rates reinforce what I'm saying. And it takes a really strong partner to be able to, to put up with uh, the long deployments and and all that, and I got really lucky when when I met Iris, in that uh, um, you know, she did that. Now I will say this though, is that I, I was just kind of floundering around, and so uh, I'd been in like sixteen years. I had just put on E seven, which is kind of late to make chief. And then after we were together and married, like she forced me to mature and check my ego. And I force is a bad word, but as a result of us being together, that after that, my just my career skyrocketed. And um, you know, you talk to Jocko 
or anybody who knew me before we met and after we met, we met, it's like she's the best thing that ever happened. And uh, I think, you know, because my home life wasn't, uh, was, was really squared away and I wasn't terrorizing around town like an idiot, which I was before. <laughs> Guilty as charged too. Now y'all you got a cool setup. You got your own homestead. Can you describe to our listeners some of the the goals and missions that you guys have now as a family to help live off the grid more or less? Where are you based out of as well? Yeah, so I live. Uh, I'm we're two and a half hours north of Spokane, um, right up on the Canadian border in northeastern Washington. <clears throat> we have a, a a forty acre property there. Um, that we're getting ready to build a house on and right next to it we are living on a three acre property in a little one bedroom cabin with a schoolhouse we have horses uh we have a big garden um when i met iris she was working on a a guest ranch as a wrangler and so part of the agreement for her to marry me and come down to san diego is that i would get her a place where we, we would live somewhere where she could see her horses out the window and they wouldn't be in the stable. So like living in a, uh, you know, any kind of suburban setting was out of the question. So when, when she, well, she came down to San Diego for like eight months and I deployed, she went back up to Washington and worked and we got married and came back down and got an eight acre place that we could have the horses on and got a big garden. And then later we got an 18 acre place and she started an organic farm there and we started raising she started raising organic vegetables that she was selling to this uh, this guy, Pete's Paleo, who prepackages paleo meals and sends them to people, which was awesome because when you're growing food, that's the toughest thing is being able to sell it. So we weren't in a situation where we'd have, we'd have to pick stuff and then take it to like a farmer's market and hope it all sells. You know, when the stuff, when we pick stuff, it was sold. And that was through our relationship with, with Pete's Paleo, which was awesome. And then we also had families that um, when we had excess stuff, we would sell them packages. So that was great. And But we really wanted to get out of San Diego and get somewhere more, more wildernessy. And so that's when, you know, when we retired, we sold our place in San Diego. When I retired, we sold our place in San Diego. We moved up to Northeastern Washington. And essentially we're on the edge of the wilderness. I mean, there's black bears that come on prosperity, deer, elk, turkey, all that. And we're trying to live a lifestyle where most of the food we eat is stuff that we've grown or stuff that I've hunted. And so ethically, as I think about it, you know, I want, if I'm gonna eat meat, I wanna eat meat that has as little suffering for animals as properly as, as possible. and as healthy as possible. So instead of, you know, buying beef from someplace where they've been in a feedlot standing around in their own shit and um, eating grain and they're pumped full of hormones and antibiotics, I, I'm going to try and get some grass fed free range beef. And uh, here soon when, when my kids have got their hunting license, we'll be to a point where all the protein we take in is, is wild caught. So it's animals that have lived their life completely free and have it had any, you know, any hormones or any antibiotics any pumped into them. And, and so that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do. And it's, it's a lot of work, but it's really, really rewarding. And just the fact that, you know, when I'm out in nature and it's wide open and it's beautiful, it's, it's, it's really peaceful. It settles me down and, uh, and we like it. And so it, it's, it's been a great, great move for us. And, uh, um, you know, we really enjoy sharing it on social media because there's a lot of other people that they're, they're the same thing, that they have the same goals as us. They, they live somewhere where they're in an urban environment and they want to get to somewhere more rural and have a lifestyle where, you know, they're, they know where their food came from and they're living, you know, more with the land. Which it's not for everybody and that's fine, but it's, it's, it's working great for us and we, we really like it. No, I think the the farther you get away and towards something like you're talking about, the I think the less stress and the happier people are. Uh, I know we lived in Newport Beach, and uh, what was it, over four and a half years ago, we ended up selling everything. We moved out here, and we live on 16 acres here in Texas. And at the time, uh, I know you've been out to this area. We thought we were living in the country, but uh, 
Austin exploded, and I guess the city done moved to us is the joke that my neighbor says. But it's um, it's still nice to uh, be out there. And like we said, like my neighbor has 50 horses. They have a horse school, and uh, they turn them out yeah. in the pastures. So every morning we wake up and we see horses running through our pastures. And my daughter draws pictures, or both of my daughters draw pictures of them. And it's uh, it's really become this really interesting thing in our lives. And um, I dig it. There, there's something there's something that is absolutely magical. And as I talk about it, I'm getting goosebumps right now of just watching horses run. And, you know, being able to have that experience and watching the horses run back and forth and just see the sheer power of them is, is amazing. And I'm really enjoy, enjoying as I delve into horsemanship because I'm, I'm learning a lot about it now about finding that partnership with, with, you know, that animal and building that trust and getting him to work together. Because the apex of what I want to do with my horsemanship is to go out and hunt with him. Wow. And, uh, and that's that's awesome because when you're on horseback, you see so much more wildlife, and uh, and then the the ability to get out there, get closer to the animals, and then just do that in a partnership with my horse is something I'm I'm really looking forward to, and it's you know it's it's great. You you got out of Newport Beach at the perfect time. Oh. I mean that <laughs> traffic there, oh. it grief. Yeah, no, I just, it's. I, I, I grew up in San Clemente, and my parents still live there. And when I go back and visit, you know, oftentimes I'm like, "Hey, this place is great," but gosh, it's really crowded. Uh, I remember. So my mom, uh, I grew up in Palos Verdes, and uh, so my oh, mom, boy. yeah, so my uh, my mom and dad bought their home there in like '66. So we grew up there, and I was living in Newport Beach because my brothers were. Uh, my brother went to law school at Cal Western down in San Diego. And he, he applied for two jobs with the DA in San Diego and Orange County. He ended up getting the job in Orange County, so he moved to you know Newport Beach is where he moved. And then my other brother, he ended up moving there, and so I was like, oh shit, I, I guess I'll move there too. Uh, While well, I was, I think at the time I was playing with the Chiefs, and um, I remember uh, I was living down by the wedge, uh, about three blocks from the wedge, uh, you know, right on the beach. And uh, I remember I had to go visit my mom uh, and during the summer. And it took me 45 minutes to get off the peninsula. And then it was another three and a half hours to get from Newport Beach up the 405, you know, eight lanes, bumper to bumper to get to Palos Verdes. And it was like a four hour deal that roughly is about 29 to 30 miles. And I remember thinking, yeah. like, fuck, like uh, I just wasted most of my day sitting in traffic with a whole bunch of other people that are just like, and at the time there was no podcasts because now I would just sit there and listen yeah. to podcasts. And uh, it's the... I tell people, I'm like, it's the most beautiful place on earth, uh, but for the people and the traffic and just the congestion, it's fucking like, it just blows my mind. And uh, I like, I just couldn't deal with it anymore. It was too much. Like where we were in Newport Beach and where our office were in Costa Mesa was roughly about four miles. It was a 20 minute commute mm -hmm. just to try to get down 17th. And it just, after a while, you're like, man, like, like, what are we doing here? And, you know, and, uh, you know, planes yeah. flying over from John Wayne and, I remember a dude in a matte black Lamborghini convertible pulled up and knocked on our door and made us an offer in cash for our house. And we were out of there 30 days later. Wow. Nice. Yeah. That's total great. Deep. What years did you play for the Chiefs? Uh, I play, I got drafted to the Eagles in 99. So I played there from 99 through 03. And then I went to the Chiefs in, uh, I got traded right before training camp. Uh, and I was there 04, 05, 06, 07, 08. And then, um, I left the Chiefs and went to the Patriots in 2008, and I got hurt and retired in 09. Wow. Good career. I had a buddy, Chad Flick, played at the Chiefs, but I think he was there um, He was there prior to you being at the Chiefs. Was he there with, like, uh, Marty Schottenheimer kind of a deal time? I, I, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, great dude. Hurt his yeah. knee, got done with football, and then, then – now he's working as a uh, um, a, a, a prison guard. Oh, damn, that's a uh, hard work. No, I was going to say uh, it's, it's not that big a difference. <laughs> oh. <laughs> except uh, except the except the inmates are dressed a little bit different. But uh, yeah, no, um, we we played a ton in San Diego because you know, like we would, uh, you know, they were winning AFC the West, yeah. yeah. And I remember Donnie Edwards, who I played against at UCLA, and then he was at the Chiefs and went to San Diego, and then I played with him at the Chiefs, so. It was a, uh, it was, yeah, it was a good deal. But yeah, the, uh, it was, it was a really fun job. Uh, I always tell people is like, 
the greatest job in the world. You get paid a bunch of money to go up and beat people up on TV and fucking get dressed up and people cheer your name. It's great. How could you be upset about it? The only thing cooler. You, you can't. Well, the, and then the, the opportunity to be on a team, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the only thing cooler is uh, I ended up, um, you know, I got hired by NSW to do some fun stuff. And uh, I got to go to uh, Mid-South and, with uh -huh. one of the teams for a week. And uh, it was cool, like, as we were setting up and, like, basically, like, uh, in the kill house blowing the doors with the ordinance, uh, I was like, this is a fucking cooler job. You yeah. guys got to blow stuff up and shoot things. And I'm like, okay, I didn't even know this existed. So, like, uh, you know, when I, I, like, I think I had, like, 100 scholarship offers when I was a sophomore or junior in high school. And so then I went to Berkeley. Yeah. And, like, it, it wasn't necessarily something I was exposed to because, um, you know, uh, like, my dad was, you know, uh, you know, attorney. It just wasn't something like we, not necessarily a military family. And so it wasn't until later on I got to do this. I was like, oh, I had a cool job, but this is a fucking fun job. Jason, um, what was your path to it, man? Right well, out from, of high school? From San Clemente. Did you go to San Clemente High or yeah, where'd you well, go? I was it. No, I went to San Clemente and then switched and graduated from Dana Hills. Um, but uh, my dad was a Marine. And so that's what brought me to the area was my dad wound up getting stationed at Camp Pendleton and bouncing between, between um, the Marine Corps Air Station in El Toro and Camp Pendleton for a good portion of his career. But I, I knew at age seven that I wanted to join the military. And he, I was focused heavily on the Marine Corps because that's what my dad did. And my dad, he was really low key with his service. You know, he was a, a, a JAG officer. That meant he was a, a lawyer in the Marine Corps. So he wasn't like one of these really gung-ho parents. In fact, when I talked to him about joining the Marines, he begged me, he's like, don't join the Marine Corps. Um, you know, there's three other services or uh, um, you, you could look at those, but, um, and then I got exposed to uh, a, a team guy that was a SEAL in Vietnam when I was taking this uh, martial art called Kaja Kempo in San Clemente. And, my parents were like, hey, that guy was a SEAL in Vietnam. And I was like, what are, what are SEALs? And they're like, this is the, you know, the Navy Special Forces. And when I started looking at what they did, I'm like, well, shoot, I'm a beach kid. I played water polo and swam in high school. This is perfect for me. So I latched onto that um, junior year of high school. And then that was just my focus. And then I joined um, right out, joined the Navy right out of high school, went to boot camp, A school, and then, then, then the BUDS, which is our selection. And then checked in the SEAL Team Five in February of 1989. Oh, geez. So all the uh, all the instructors, um, my uh, I think it was my dad's cousin was a UDT guy in Vietnam, and uh, uh -huh. he, we when we'd have family barbecues, um, he used to get fucking hammered. He was an alcoholic, <laughs> uh, so bad, so much so that he used to drink uh, vodka and milk because it, uh, he had such a bad ulcer <laughs> that he drank vodka and milk. Which, in hindsight, like. Now I think about him like, man, he was a serious alcoholic. But um, yeah, he was, uh, yeah. And so that that was really only my exposure was like uh, the UDT. So when you came in the SEAL teams, all the guys that were the instructors and kind of your mentors were all Vietnam guys. <laughs> there was only a few of them left, you know, because Vietnam ends at 73 and we're talking towards the end of the 90, end of the 80s. So there were, there were still maybe um, four Vietnam vets around that I was exposed to on a regular basis and, and, and just having any time at all that you could have with these guys was magic because, you know, there were no, there were no wars going on. So there's a blip on the radar. There was like Grenada, there was Panama, but those were like really small deals and they weren't sustained. So being around the Vietnam vets was, really really cool but we were getting to a dangerous point where there wasn't anybody around with combat experience and so we were coming up with tactics and things that really wouldn't have worked on the battlefield so can, because, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that like uh, I've, I've always been kind of amazed where we went through this time and there was these peacetime seals and then all of a sudden like there wasn't uh this historical knowledge like we have now where now we have 20 years of battle and, and experience to be able to teach the young guys how was that like transition when you guys, you know, first kicked off the war and went in and started doing it without any kind of practical experience or, you know, think tank to be able to kind of push you guys in a certain direction? So what had happened is, is like going into it, a lot of the stuff we overthought 
And so we'd made assumptions about what it would be like to get shot at. And, and there were some things that the Vietnam SEALs couldn't even help us with. Because, you know, when you're fighting 47 SEALs in an urban environment, someone that's fighting eight SEALs or 16 SEALs max at a time in a jungle, they can give you some advice, but it's limited. So we had to learn. But what, what saved us is that our that cycle that we're in of like I was talking about where we give debriefs. And we say, hey, this is what this is what we faced. This is this is what we did. And so, as guys are starting to go forward to the battlefield, they're going, they're 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 sending us back information. Hey, we need to get smart on things like mobility. Like back in the '90s, we didn't think that we were ever going to be doing convoys in Humvees through urban environments or off road. You know, we didn't think that. And then then all of a sudden, we're doing it. So. They're giving us feedback and the feedback's coming directly from the battlefield back to the training and it's getting implemented immediately or as fast as possible, right? So if there aren't a bunch of Humvees, it takes a second to round all those up so we can start practicing. And then um, we'll start looking at people that have more information that can teach us how to do things. For instance, like uh, when we started to doing the personal security details for the top five in Iraq, the PSD, well, we started getting advice from guys at the secret service or guys at other agency that done that type of mission and like, Hey, teach us how to do it. And then we would start doing it and put our own spin on it and say, well, maybe this works a little better and here's some different ways we can do it. So it was a, it was a learning curve, but I, it also helps us because when you go in thinking that you don't know anything, your eyes are then wide open. Right. And so we're like, uh Oh, it's been a long time since we've had combat. We better, like see how we can improve and it, it automatically um, humbles you in a way. Yeah, we said there's there one team guy, um, Mike Martin, who was a Vietnam vet and he had broken service. So he got out for a while and then he came back in and, um, you know, he did tattoos. He had a bunch of tattoos on me and he was just, oh, he was an awesome guy. And he was over at SEAL Team 3 and their tactics that they were doing over at Team 3 at the time were better than everybody else on the strand because Mike was reteaching them like a lot of the old tactics that they'd learned in Vietnam. Because everybody, all those other guys had gotten out and were gone or been promoted so far away from the tactical level, they weren't able to give it. But I remember, I remember getting a tattoo from Mike one day, and Mike's like, hey, did I ever tell you about the guy I killed with a knife in Vietnam? And I was like, no, no, you know, any story that these guys could tell me about combat, I wanted to hear it. He goes, so I'm patrolling through the jungle. And this VC jumps out of the brush and he's got a knife. So I shot him. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral to that story is knife kills are messy and they're stupid. Don't do it. And then he went on to tell me about two situations where guys decided because of their egos, hey, I'm going to kill somebody with a knife. And in one case, the guy stabbed this Vietnamese guy and the knife, the K-bar went straight through him and the guy wound up stabbing himself in the leg. And then they had to call it off and medevac it. And then the other time where the guy stabs the guy in the neck and the guy, blood just goes flying everywhere and the guy starts screaming. So they get compromised by that. And the whole op is compromised and they got to wave it off. Whereas, you know, what they normally do is just shoot people with a suppressed gun and be done with it. And don't expose yourself to all this other possible disaster just so later on you can stand around a barbecue and tell people that you killed somebody with a knife. Well, it, it's always really clean in a movie. You know, you see the Rambo and, the, you know, like, well, like I if, mean, every if, knife kill, every knife kill that you've ever seen in any movie is like, if we pull movie quotes, Untouchable Sean Connery, leave it to an Irishman to bring a knife to a gunfight. Ah, oh, it's a good one. Yeah, you know, uh, the but uh, it's the same thing. The the moral of the story is it's like someone who is out there doing the job is like, hey, that stuff is dumb. Use the tools that you have and and get it done, um, the right way. But well, I mean, but yeah, the, we, we the essence seal is is C. So I always imagine like, and, and this is purely just speculation. I imagine like the first guys get deployed into Af you know Iraq or Afghanistan. They show up, they get dropped off, and they have their like flippers and masks with them, and they're like, "Oh shit, there's no water around here. I guess we don't have to pack this stuff." Yeah, 
And uh, I mean, that's a testament to, to how good we're able to adapt because we're a maritime force. And yet we were in two wars that essentially were in landlocked countries. You know, a little bit of coastline in Iraq and both of them had rivers, but um, in doing so well all the way up to 2016 and 17 when we were running the combined the siege of Sodif for Iraq was naval special warfare. Running it was the co combined joint special operations task force is what that signs for. And so it means that we were the the in charge of all the special operations in Iraq was a, an NSW commander. And that's a lot. That speaks to how busy the, the country was, but also speaks to how well we were able to adapt and, and come from a maritime thing to really excel in, uh, um, in a land warfare environment. Is it the screening process? Um, you know, I like I've always had this. Uh, I ask people this question: Is um, are there such thing as great men, or is it just interesting times where average men are forced to step up and you know, and, we, and then we define them later as greatness? Like you think about these major points in history where we've had these just incredibly charismatic individuals. Is it like the uh, the moment that defines the individual, or was it just the great individual? And I think sometimes for the SEAL teams. Um, as you talk about like the mobility and the ability to adapt, is there something within the training process that screens for that? Or is it just, hey, you know what, these guys can suffer more than everybody else and we put them in and the system allows these guys to flourish? Yeah, so I, I, my thought is, is that it's the situation. Whereas like they talk about the greatest generation in World War II, but if, if we were to reach some kind of existential threat right now, I think we would see a lot of our, our youth stand up and take that challenge on with the same fervor and vigor that our forefathers did. Um, and so what made us successful in, in, makes us successful in the SEAL teams is that we have built into our culture this idea that we are constantly adapting and improving. And we actually, our culture to a little bit disdains like doctrinal thinking, which, it, and there are problems with that, but our culture is always looking at doing something new. And because we have this, this system built into of, of debriefing what we're doing and, and everybody has a voice in that debrief, that's what the secret to our success is is that we're we're we pride ourselves in, in our adaptability and our creativity um and then of course our, our selection helps you know in that that it's a very rig rigorous thing just to get in the door it that that that's that helps quite a bit too are you still actively training now swimming lifting weights and do anything or is the the homestead enough work yeah, the homestead winds up, you know, when I'm, I'm moving like 80 bales in a day to, to load up for the horses, it, it's good. And, and mo I'm, my, my focus right now is uh, just body weight, calisthenic type of stuff where it's like, you know, a set of air squats, push-ups, um, sit-ups. I've got to get back to deadlifting and kettlebells. And, and I just need to get some more discipline about it because it is really, really good for you. And I, I, I have absolutely no excuse why I'm not doing it because I've got the hex bar. I've got the kettlebell sitting right there in my shop. I just need to, to, to carve out more time to get it done. What about uh, um, any interest in becoming a farrier or starting to do some of that work? I know that the farrier that shows up next door to shoe horses for uh, my neighbor, I always get a chance to go over there because I'm always fascinated with like his whole setup and his truck and all the equipment and tools he has. But I'll tell you, dude, you shake that cat's hand. <laughs> like I always make a chance. He's... Like the fucking grip strength on that dude, it's pretty impressive. And I always joke with him, like you yeah. swing a hammer with both hands because his uh, like one arm is not necessarily bigger. And he made a funny point. He's like, after a while, you realize there's a lot of technique and angles. And he's like, uh, you would muscle it, but he's like, if you want to be last a long time, you got to be real efficient in how you swing a hammer. And he's like, I'm real good and efficient. And I was like, fucking old man, still teaching this stuff. Yeah, I my our our farrier, um, this great guy Blake, man, and he's. He's older than me, and I'll see him, and he's, you know, 80% of his day, he's hunched over like this, holding a horse hook that half the time the horse is fighting on him, and, and then pounding nails in and trimming it and all that. 
no, I don't have any interest in doing that. Um, <laughs> you know, I've got to work with running the homestead and, and, and doing the echelon front gig and talking to people. And, and two, I'm really glad that I've got uh, Blake in my life because the guy is also a horse trainer and he's teaching me a whole bunch about, you know, interacting with my horse and, and all that. But, you know, it's, it's astute that you notice how hard that work is because a lot of people won't even pay attention to how hard somebody else is working. And you look at that job and like that is a very vigorous job. And well, those I, guys get kicked pretty quick. Yeah, no, I, I weld and fabricate and work on steel. So uh, I, he broke something yeah. and, came, and came over and I fixed uh, like one, like I forgot what it is. It's like, uh, it looks like a wrench and they use it to kind of like dig and like, um, like it looks like a, like a big fucking toenail clipper almost. And so he ended yeah, up messing it up. He, yeah. So he came over and I welded it up, cleaned it up and then brought it back. So I'm just, uh, I'm always amazed by like their tools and like, you know, how the setup works and, you know, he's got like a little forge and then like this little trailer and it's like super just efficient and like he, he uses a half ton truck, which always blows my fucking mind. I'm like, what about like a yeah. one ton truck? He's like, nah, I need a half ton truck. I'm not pulling that heavy. It's just real efficient. And uh, like that was his whole deal is like, if you, if you're going to do this job, it would be real efficient. But he also, I mean, the exercise is just pushing those big dumb animals around. I mean, horses are extremely emotional and very um, like pretty fascinating. If you think about uh, like they say fascia and this comes from Cal Dietz's RPR emotion and emotional intelligence comes from the fascia and gets stored there. And if you look at a horse, I mean, their majority, like the fascia, the way it kind of connects, I mean, their brains aren't big, but they're extremely um, emotionally intelligent. Like they can tell if somebody's sad, they can really pick up on emotion, but just aren't naturally intelligent animals. So then you have to look and like, so what's intelligence with emotional intelligence? So it's just kind of an interesting observation. And then getting to see them in the environment and as techs, I mean, they, Dude, they're all outside and just seeing like their groups and their social circles and how they act and they're like they're pretty funny and just kind of amusing animals. Yeah. Jason, do you ride bareback? Uh, I I can. It's not something that I often do. I'm getting ready to see if my horse knows how to swim, and when you swim a horse, you do it bareback, and yeah. so that for that I'll do it. But you know, I, my horsemanship is not to the level where. I'll be really good at bareback like my wife or her friends are but it's super interesting that you brought that up like i've realized lately that the biggest thing when i'm dealing with my horse if i'm frustrated they'll pick up on that in a second and it's i might as well have a neon sign on my forehead that says i'm getting frustrated and so i notice that when i'm getting frustrated the horse will start to act up and then i'm like hey i gotta calm down and then he'll he'll mirror that and he'll calm right down and then, um, yeah, it's a super interesting thing too. It's a, it's a super interesting when you look at any craftsman and how they do that. Like when I will watch the, the the contractors that that I, I'm hiring to, to to build stuff on the property, and I just look at how efficient they are, and like th there isn't any action that's wasted there with what they do, and it's it's fascinating. To me. I love to learn about. It. Or uh, um, you started like, um, I'm, I mean, obviously those guys are doing it, but uh, in your environment or like any dirt work, are you out there running, you know, track loader, skid steers, any of that type of stuff? Yeah, I've got, so my one neighbor that I hired to come over and, and uh, do backhoe work, right? And um, that, that backhoe is essentially an extension of him. And you'll watch when he stretches the thing out and he'll tap, tap, tap. And he'll start to dig and then he'll like he can tell the difference between hitting a water line and a tree root somehow while he's in there working those things it's 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 an it's amazing um and you know it's 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 always at the end of the day it's cheaper to hire someone to do that because they come with all the expertise and trying to rent somebody <laughs> to do it yourself my uh when, so when we moved to texas my old neighbor uh, he since passed away his name was tom die and he came down and uh he used to like to show up at least, what was it, every other day and talk shit to us and tell us what uh, pieces of shit we were. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he had uh, quit school in eighth grade because he figured he learned all he needed to know. And from the time he was 13, he basically did dirt work and had a you know, super successful uh, excavation, septic, did like directional drilling. And uh, he came down and he would, um, uh, like if we had anything to do, he's like, go down and rent this piece of machinery. And he kind of coached me. And uh, he would bring his guys over who were just like these wizards with like, you know, skid steers and this and all this just dirt work because it's all they'd done their whole lives. 
and it makes you realize that opportunity and uh, like experience and just the like the opportunity and length of time behind it, just sitting behind the sticks. I mean, it's like shooting or driving and anything like you get somebody behind the wheel who's never driven and they're nervous you know after you've put thousands of years or shut thousands of rounds it becomes so automatic and for these guys like uh, i remember where our building is the guy graded uh the plot and i remember when the when the guys came out to pour the concrete he like brought out his you know tripod with like the deal to be able to shoot the um to shoot the elevation and uh the one corner to corner was off less than a quarter of a degree so the guy graded, it was a 92 by 50 plot, like built up the dirt, did everything, didn't do anything, didn't, didn't stake it, nothing, just purely with eyesight. This, uh, this Mexican cat named Emilio and a skid steer dude graded this thing within like, it was like a quarter of a, of a degree to half a degree from corners. They shot it from everything. And the dude was like, who did this? And I was like, oh, my neighbor's guy, he, he came down, he does dirt work. And he's like, fuck man, I've never seen anything like this. And it just, wow, you know, that's, uh, well, I want you know, to analogy. add like that that can be accomplished with with horse riding as well. I had a, a dude ranch job post college. I couldn't get a job, so shoveling horse shit. And then the trainers taught me how to ride. And I played lacrosse in college, so it worked towards playing a sport called polo cross. So we were playing lacrosse on horses, and like it's a mm-hmm. switch where I want, I feel, I want to go to this position on the field. And then it's, it's not a matter of like coaxing the horse to get there. And like, I had one horse that I rode for the eight weeks and eventually it was, it was cool. It was almost like avatar to where we were able to turn it into play and competition. Were you the broken little Marine or the big monkey? Uh, I am a broken little (laughs) Marine boy. (laughs) No, but, uh, no, it was, it's so cool. And like that, the fact that you're interested in as well. And then we're talking about skill development And like, I just imagine you learn to hunt on a freaking horse. Well, is that going to be bow and arrow? Or are you going to be pulling out like? So, so my daughters had never ridden. And then we move in, we, we buy this property and my neighbors who are the nicest people in the world, they have a horse school and she does hunter and jumpers and English. And, uh, so then like at age, I think we were what the girls were probably four when we moved here, they had like a summer camp and my wife's like, do you want to send them to summer camp? So we sent them to the school and I'm like, well, I don't have to drive anywhere. We can just fucking walk them over there. <laughs> So we take them to summer camp and they go and then it was like, uh, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're going to take them for lessons or whatever. And then all of a sudden my wife ends up because uh, we have a big building with a bitch and gym and then my shop is in there. Next thing you know, my wife is like training uh, the owner and all the trainers to lift weights and all the all the people. So now like my daughter's riding five days a week and it's what she does. I mean, she's like five days a week and this little girl now she's nine. And like her skill on the horse, because it's what she does every single day. She looks at him. She sees him outside. She has like, you know, draws horses. Her friends talk about horses. They call themselves the pony squad, which I think is hilarious. And it's, <laughs> it's just their entire existence are these horses. And it's like, and they're like, oh, they're so good. I'm like, well, yeah, if this is, if you dedicate your life to something, like, how are you not good at it? If you give it enough opportunity and enough time. You know, so you think about like, hey, all of a sudden I'm, I'm working towards this and it's like, you know, what's the volume of work that I'm doing to get there? Is it the same that I did from in my previous role? Uh, absolutely. And uh, um, that partnership with the horse, and that that give and take. Uh, I mean, because there are people that ride their whole horses their whole lives and and all they do is just spur the hell out of the horses and abuse them and they don't get the best out of the horse. Whereas, you know, like Tex was saying, you get to that point where you're just attached, where you just look the direction you go and the horse knows that, hey, that's the direction we're going and you don't have to apply any leg or rein. And uh, um, yeah, it's 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 really cool. And that's just, a, that's a fabulous opportunity that your daughter has to do that because it's just gonna make her so much a better person having, having that, you know, developing the relationship and, and everything that you gotta do with the horse in general. So- so um, do you, do you, do you ever get up to I'm Canada? Uh, like, uh, so like, um, my mom grew up in Vancouver, so I kind of know that part uh-huh. of the country we would drive through, you know, twice a year, we drive from California up to Vancouver and stop all the way up there. So I'm fairly decently familiar with that part of the world. Uh, so what do you, um, what's the big hunt? What are you training for? I mean, I know those big Roosevelt Elks are down in Oregon and there's some pretty amazing stuff up around there. So I'm going to hit, I'm going to, in years to come, I'm going to pack into Idaho elk hunting. And then, um, 
the muleys are a little bit higher up in the mountain and they're they're bigger and so i want to go after mule deer and just go out and just it just have have it be a couple days with me and my horse and at the end of the experience you know i'm bringing back uh, meat for the freezer um yeah i don't know uh we're the the canadian border has been closed but we we're 20 minutes from the Canadian border and we spend a lot of time up in Rosalind and we ski at Red Mountain and all that when it's, uh, when we can get up there, we love it. And we're really looking forward to when they open the border back up again. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, my mom usually keeps me up to date on the Canadian politics and it doesn't look very good because I know our cousins, uh, you know, have a place down in Palm Springs and I know it's been pretty arduous to try for for them to come down. Yeah, I mean, a, a bunch of them aren't, I think they can come down, but the process to go back is so difficult with the uh, the quarantine and whatever that, that a lot of them aren't coming down here. I, it, but I think uh, I think the 22nd of this month or 21st, they're, they're possibly going to open up back up again. So we'll see. Killer. Anything else? No man, looking no. looking forward to connecting in person at the NSCA Tactical. Shake yeah. the hand. Well, no, I, I just thought it was funny when I told Doc. He was like, "Oh, that guy's legendary," and I was like, <laughs> "Like, and, like, uh, uh, I wasn't sure if it was like legend, like uh, good or bad." Uh, Parsley such an interesting cat, like uh, uh, almost like the absent-minded professor sometimes. Like, um, uh-huh. he, like he, he'll he'll hit me up. He hit me up the other day and was like, "Hey, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow to work out." And uh, he didn't, I haven't seen him for like a week. And then all of a sudden he just randomly showed up and I was like, Hey, I thought I was going to see you last week. He's like, yeah, I said I was going to see you. I said, but it was tomorrow. And he's like, <laughs> what, what's today? And I'm like, doc, like, like we got to get on a better schedule with this thing. But he, uh, yeah, he'll just yeah. randomly shows up and he knows usually Wednesday is not our workout day. So like, uh, we'll usually take Wednesday off and whatnot. And he shows up, uh, he like calls me. He's like, where are you guys? I'm like, it's fucking Wednesday. You know, we don't train on <laughs> Wednesday. That's like the conditioning day. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll get it. I'm like fucking parsley, yeah, I love him though. He, uh, yeah. um, I, uh, I banged my elbow real hard, and um, I got a bursa sack. Uh, like my elbow fucking exploded, and yeah. so I go over to Parsley's house, and he's out like on his porch with like pulls out his like you know medical kit, and he's over there like drawing out this stuff. Like took 25, 25 cc's of blood off of my elbow, and he's like, oh, you'll be fine." You know, and he's like, uh, I don't have any anesthetic. I don't have any like uh, lidocaine. No, no. He's like, you'll be fine. It, you know, it's just the elbow. And I'm like, this is great. I get to come over and see my doc. And he basically drains my elbow right on his thing. And he's like, you want a beer? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'll see you later. So now he's, uh, uh, we love him. He's great. He's great. And, and, and I, I honestly believe that he saved my life and he saved the lives of tons of team guys because he realized that like, when I came back from my 2009 deployment, and I was a slow motion train wreck and um, I was addicted to Ambien. I wasn't sleeping very well. And he helped fix all that. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah. So he noticed that all these, these physical problems that guys were having the SEAL teams, i.e. like a 27 year old guy having the testosterone of a 13 year old girl and figured out that it was because our sleep patterns were completely jacked up and because guys were using sleep aids and helped us get into, you know, what then was just a, a, a bunch of supplements you know, all natural supplements to help us get good sleep. And then later, you know, to, to his sleep remedy, which I, I take religiously, it really helps. And, and Me too. Um, I, I take two a night. Yeah. And I, I've seen, like, my health is exponentially better than it was then. I, I was, there were three different medications I was taking every day. I don't take anything now. Um, of course, adjusting my diet helped, but the most powerful thing I did to get my health better and my mental stage better was fixing, fixing my sleep. And I owe him forever for that. Yeah, no, he's, uh, um, yeah, no, his, his stuff with sleep and just what he what he's able to do. And, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, when I get my blood work done twice a year, uh, I always ship it over to him just to take a look and make sure everything's working right. And, uh, he is, uh, I'm glad I count him as a friend and I'm glad I get to see him as often as we do. Cause realistically, uh, he's a fucking sharp dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a good cat. He so. is. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on power athlete radio. Um, no, you and Tex are going to, uh, you know, connect in person. So that'll be killer, but 
If you're ever out this way in Texas, please look us up. I know uh, you guys do some stuff out here in Austin. We're right down the street from uh, Dripping Springs and uh, um, geez, and also uh, I don't know. Uh, do, do you know Todd White? Um, he he uh, he's a Jean Jacques Machado guy. Uh, no, I, I don't. But I'm sure you know Leif and those guys know him. They, they got the thing in Jip, Dripping Springs, and we we're usually there once a year. So man, when I'm there next time, I'll have to hit you up. Yeah, man, we'll we'll go out and have some fun. So for sure, sounds good. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, Jason. Thank you very much. Cool. And thanks for tuning in. Another thanks. episode. I'm a great train and I'm right on track. I'm smoking.